Hello, I thank the PD Rhythm Committee very much for their invitation to speak about the topic Ethnic Specific Genomic Differences. My name is Cordula Wolf and I'm from the German Heart Center in Munich, uh, located at the Technical University in Munich in Germany. I have no conflicts of interest related to this topic to declare. So, uh, we are all different. This is not a very earth-shaking new finding. So why am I being asked to give a talk about this topic here at PD Rhythm? One reason might be that I'm a very classical Bavarian from Munich in Germany. And um, by the way, if I weren't here now, I would probably be attending the Oktoberfest in Munich wearing my dirndl right now. Um, I guess most likely the reason is because molecular genetics nowadays are part of our clinical practice as pediatric cardiologists and electrophysiologists, especially when dealing with inherited arrhythmia disorders, cardiomyopathies and sudden cardiac death. So the goal for my today's talk is to first back up a little bit and to summarize how we are currently using molecular genetics and genomics in the field of pediatric cardiology and electrophysiology. Second, to provide a small historical overview on ethnic specific differences in some exemplary arrhythmic diseases. And last, to give an outlook on how our current knowledge can be implicated in clinical practice and what progress is going on to further improve patients' care in a global setting. One slide on back up to, to refresh our minds a little bit. So among humans, 99%, 99.9% of the bases in the entire genome are remarkably similar. The remaining 0.1% of the bases make up make a person very unique. Among this 0.1% of bases, which is very little, more than 90% are uh, SNPs or single nucleate polymorphisms, which is um, a SNP is defined as a single base exchange in a DNA sequence that occurs in a significant proportion, so more than 1% of a large population. And 15% of those SNPs are population specific. So where do we currently use molecular genetics and genomics in the field of pediatric cardiology and electrophysiology? In many occasions, we are faced with genomics when we perform our routine workup on a patient with a known phenotype or an unclear phenotype or within family cascade screening if a patient presents with an inherited cardiac disease. As per the most updated guidelines, the recently endorsed uh, by the European Society of Cardiology and others, of course, as well, genetic testing nowadays is a class one recommendation in all patients diagnosed with a disease that has a likely genetic basis, as is the case in inherited arrhythmia syndromes and cardiomyopathies. And once a pathogenic variant has been identified in a living or a, a diseased individual, genetic testing can also identify asymptomatic relatives, which then allows implication of preventive measures such as counseling on lifestyle, for example, avoiding participation in competitive sports and HCM, or it can enable the initiation of medical therapy such as beta blockers in the long QT syndrome. So that is also, um, it's called family cascade screening to um, improve prevention. That is also a class one indication. In addition to diagnostics, genomics might also impact patient management, and we call this nowadays precision medicine. For example, genetic parameters are now included in individual risk estimations of long QT patients, as shown here on the slide. 
For example, children who are carriers of a genetic mutation in the poor region of the long QT2 syndrome, causing gene, the KCNH2, are at increased risk for experiencing major arrhythmic events when compared to patients carrying other genetic mutations. This, of course, influences our counseling as well as the initiation of appropriate therapies. And of course, we do know all about the specific triggers for life-threatening events in the distinct types of long QT, such as exercise and long QT type 1, emotions and sleep in long QT type 2, or sleep in long QT type 3. And last but not least, we are already using genotype-specific treatments when we administer maxillidine to long QT3 patients, and for example in the field of cardiomyopathies and rare diseases, when genotypic etiology is more and more of importance regarding the choice of individualized medical treatments, such as in resopathy, res resopathies or resopathic um, associated cardiomyopathies and the new treatment options that exist in this field right now. So those were just a few examples showing how genomics play a major role in our daily clinical practice. Now, what about the ethnic-specific genomic differences and why do those matter? It is very clear that there are unquestionably influences of ethnicity when it comes down to arrhythmogenic disorders. For example, there is a clearly increased incidence of sudden arrhythmic death in certain ethnic groups as shown here. The incidence in Laishinmon, other Laishin and Camogian populations are between 59 and 92 in 100,000 persons, whereas it is only 1 to 3 per 100,000 people in Caucasian. So there's a large fall increase in the incidence of sudden arrhythmic deaths in certain Asian populations. In fact, sudden arrhythmic death in young, otherwise healthy men, predominantly occurring in their sleep, was first de described in certain Asian regions starting in the beginning of the 20th century. Later on, in 1960, no, 1976, unusually high death rates among young male Laotian and Cambodian refugees in the United States after the end of the Vietnam War. The disease was named SUDS or Sudden Unexplained Death Syndrome occurred. Additionally, in 1982 and 1990, the sudden death of 230 otherwise healthy young Thai foreign workers living in Singapore had been noted. A subsequent epidemiologic study showed that the condition had been prevalent in Thailand for more than 50 years, named Lai Thai, which means sleep and die. One subtype of this SADS, or Sudden Unexpected Death Syndrome, was later then defined as Brugada Syndrome, characterized by the classical features depicted on ECG and an increased risk for sudden arrhythmic death. Brugada Syndrome was later defined as a, as a disease allelic to the Sudden Unexplained, unexplained Nocturnal Death Syndrome in the Asian population, and its genetic basis was described to line mutations of the SCN5A gene encoding for the cardiac sodium gel. Another example being a subtype of arrhythmic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, the so-called Naxos disease, was first described in 1988 by Dr. Protonotarios and colleagues on the island of Naxos. Naxos is situated to the northeast of a group of islands called the Cuclades in Greece. The Greek colleagues described an inherited condition with a recessive form of transmission and a familial penetrance of 90% or greater that was associated with a cutaneous phenotype consisting of thickening of the skin, of the hands and soul, and a propensity to woolly hair. 
the cardiac abnormalities characterized by ventricular arrhythmias with ventricular extrasystoles and tachycardia and histologic features of the myocardium that were consistent with ARVD. In Naxos disease, there was a most severe form of replacement of the myocardium by fat and fibrosis with major dilatation of the right ventricles. The identification of the responsible gene on chromosome 17 and its product placoglobin as the responsible protein causing cell adhesion defects in Naxos disease proved to be a milestone in the study of ARVD. This opened a new field of research and thanks to those with the determination to discover Naxos disease, there will be also more clarity in understanding the mechanisms of this juvenile sudden death. And last, I would like to mention the regional differences in incidence of sudden infant death syndrome that also underline the contribution of population-specific differences. As shown in this report from the Center of Disease Control, the incidence of SIDS is lowest in populations deriving from Asia or Pacific Islanders and is highest in American Indian or Alaska Native populations with an almost six-fold difference. Non-Hispanic black infants have twice the risk compared to non-Hispanic white infants. SIDS and unknown causes constitute about two-thirds of sudden and unexpected infant deaths. And although overall rates of those two entities declined considerably in 1990 following the American Academy of Pediatric Safe Sleep recommendations in 1992 and the initiation of the Back to Sleep or now Safe to Sleep campaign in 1994, the rates have remained unchanged in the past 20 years. SIDS rates are now about 38 deaths per 100,000 live births and unknown cause infant mortality 20, about 29 deaths per 100,000 live births. Some of these ethnic genomic, ethnic specific genomic influences in SIDS are explained by the presence of ultra rare non-synonymous variants within the major cardiogenelopathy associated genes that were overrepresented in SIDS cases as shown here in the study performed by the Mayo group around Michael Ackerman. The authors suggested a triple risk hypothesis meaning the contribution of genetic predisposition in SIDS in addition to exogenous stressors in a vulnerable period in the development during infancy. There are two major players explaining ethnic specific differences. First, the existence of um, founder mutations in a certain population and second, the role of modifier genes in the entire genome. Founder mutations are disease causing genetic variants that are found repeatedly in a given population and that are derived from a shared ancestor who harbored that variant. The variant A341V in the KCNQ1 gene encoding for the potassium IKS current was, for example, first described in a South African long QTS founder population. It is the most common variant of long QT syndrome and the cardiac events of these patients are almost always triggered by some sympathetic activation such as physical or emotion, emotional stress and swimming. Those are especially dangerous for them. Another example of a classical founder mutation is the identification of mutations in the DPP6 gene, which encodes for membrane protein binding to potassium channels. Those mutations were predominantly found in central regions in the Netherlands. Risk haplotype carriers had a significantly higher risk for death or cardiac arrest at the ages between 20 and 50 years compared to others. 
Another major player explaining ethnic specific differences is the ethnic specific contribution of modifier genes, as I said before. Advances in understanding the contribution of modifier genes to a higher or lower propensity towards sudden death should improve patient specific risk stratification, and this should be a major step towards precision medicine. By the time more and more patients with long QT syndrome were diagnosed by genetic testing, it became soon clear that there was a large variability of duration in QTC intervals amongst those mutation carriers. In the subsequent years, numerous studies were undertaken to show the influence of individuals' genes and proteins on the cardiac action potential. This extensive list of genes being implicated in distinct phases of the cardiac rhythm demonstrates the complexity of determining disease severity in ion genelopathies or cardiomyopathies solely based on a unique mutation. Rather, there is a myriad of modifying factors that might influence the risk for developing life-threatening arrhythmias. Genetic factors that can impact arrhythmia risk might include genes encoding determinants of primary cellular substrate for abnormal cardiomyocyte excitability, such as proteins contributing to the balance of inward and outward currents operating during the cardiac action potential, or those governing the intracellular calcium cycling or involved with trapping of cellular and membrane proteins. Some candidate modifier genes are themselves monogenic arrhythmia successibility genes, such as a cardiac ion general subunit or regulatory protein. So genetic variations with the potential for modifying arrhythmias increase the, the severity of diseases. Here to the left, for example, is a child published by Peter Schwartz a couple of years ago, a child who carried a primary long QT mutation, but also carried well-validated risk alleles influencing the cardiac action potential. This child suffered from sudden, a sudden infant death syndrome whereas his family members that carried either the genetic mutation or the risk alleles did not have serious life-threatening events in their lives. On the right, we show in the case of childhood onset hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that if patients are carrying more than one mutation in a sarcomeric gene, had a significantly higher risk for major rhythmic events compared to single mutation carriers. Another study focuses on the complexity on the genetic background in Brugada syndrome. There was a phenotype and genotype mismatch in those SCN5A families. For example, mutation carriers had an average a longer had on average longer PR and QRS intervals than non-carriers. However, the major finding of this investigation was that eight family members were clinically affected by Brugada syndrome but were not carriers of the SCN5A mutation. These observations suggest that SCN5A mutations probably act as a major modulating factor revealing the syndrome, but it is likely that other factors, like the genetic background, also do play a role. And other non-cardiac genes and proteins influencing sudden death susceptibility are those, for example, influencing autonomic responses. For example, in long QT1 patients, where we know that the main arrhythmogenic tr trigger is symptomatic, sym sympathetic activation, it is reasonable to also postulate that there is a relation between autonomic responses and arrhythmic risk. So um, variants, for example, in genes um, ADRA 2B or B1, which are selected adrenoreceptor genes, have been shown to be players and increase, increase arrhythmia susceptibility in long QT1 um, patients. So taken together, variable penetrance in certain diseases and variable disease severity can more and more be explained by genetic factors contributing to disease susceptibility and severity. Of course, in addition to other non-genetic factors such as life, lifestyle, environment, etc. 
With this, I would now like to transition to the impact of those genomic differences on our daily clinical practice. As I had pointed out earlier, genetic diagnostics are now part of our clinical workup, not only in inherited arrhythmia disorders, but also in cardiomyopathies and, of course, all diseases assumed to have a genetic etiology. Accurate interpretation of genetic variants is crucial for genetic diagnostics. Human geneticists, cardiologists and pediatric cardiologists focusing in cardiogenetics and accredited laboratories are required to use standards and guidelines when interpreting the pathology of a variant. In order to define a genetic variant as rather benign or rather pathogenic, meaning diseases disease causing or at least disease contributing significantly, um, numerous criteria need to be evaluated. Of those, the reference of a certain genetic variant in context to population-based databases is crucial. A very recent study by Volchidal showed the importance of adequate and accurate interpretation of genetic variants taking distinct population backgrounds into account. Shown here is the percentage of certain variants being classified as variants of unknown significances, likely pathogenic or pathogenic, using additional population-specific criteria in addition to the automated ACMG output. There were more variants classified as pathogenic thereafter and less classified as variants of unknown significance. Ethics-specific genomic differences are also important in proper risk stratification. For example, there is a correlation between common genetic variants and drug-induced QTC response using dufilitide, quinidine and ranolacin in the study. Common genetic variants influence the susceptibility to drug-induced QT prolongation. The same is true for inherited long QT syndrome. In this genome-wide association study that was conducted among distinct ethnicities, authors detected common genetic variations that modulate the QT interval. Thus, polygenic risk score analysis taken takes genetic background of each individual into account and al allows the identification of genetic risk factors contributing to long QT syndrome susceptibility. And last, ethnic-specific differences also influence our patient management. A good example is that currently there is a clear indication to implant ICDs in DPP-6 risk haplotype carriers aged 20 to 6 years in the Netherlands, given the high risk for cardiac arrest and sudden death in those individuals, even in the absence of any symptoms or morphologic abnormalities. This is where we are now. And uh, where are we going in the future? The major problem still remains that there is an underrepresentation of non white ethnic groups in scientific research and clinical trials, and that human genomic databases are skewed toward people of European descent. The studies performed in developed Caucasian countries may not apply well to developing Af African or Asian countries. However, trans-ethnic genome-wide association studies are more and more underway. In places with less developed infrastructure, including parts of Latin America and Africa, such efforts have lacked. The National Human Genome Research Institute has begun gathering data from these areas and sequencing analysis are usually done elsewhere. So as more such projects move forward, there will be important discoveries that will be relevant to any number of ethnic groups. And last but not least, cardiogenetics is becoming more and more important and is a growing subspecialism. And with this, I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention. I would like to thank the German Heart Center and the Technical University of Munich for supporting my research interest in cardiogenetics in children and again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk today.